Hi, my name is Jeremiah. I'm one of the pastors here and welcome to our online campus. We're so glad that you're joining us. I just want to take a couple of minutes and share with you exactly what you can expect as you're joining Westbridge Church Online. First, uh, the band is going to lead us in a few songs. And this is really to paint the picture of how big God is and how much he loves us. And it's a chance for us to respond to his grace in our lives. It reminds us that we're a part of something bigger than ourselves. And so I encourage you to sing along as much as you feel comfortable. Uh, next, after that, from time to time, we'll show some videos and some highlights of some of our global and local partners. And we wanna do everything that we can to help people find and follow Jesus right here in our community and around the world. And so every once in a while, you'll see some of the things that we're doing and highlighting some of the things that we're doing with both local and global initiatives. And then a pastor will give a talk. And one of our goals is that if you can't use it on Monday, we won't say it on Sunday. The goal for us is to give you really simple, practical teaching from the scriptures that you can apply to your daily life so that you can follow in the way of Jesus and become more like Jesus. And so it's our hope that you'll be able to take some of the things that we talk about in these services and put them into practice in your daily life. And finally, at the end of the service, you'll have an opportunity to give. And this is a way for us to recognize everything that we have has been entrusted to us by God. And we simply return back to God first. We return back to God a percentage of all that he's entrusted to us. And when we do that, our faith in God grows and we're able to make a difference in moving God's kingdom forward. And so uh, the best way to really learn about all of this, all of the events and the opportunities to give and participate here at Westbridge Church are through our Church Center app. I'd encourage you to download the Church Center app if you haven't, uh, select Westbridge Church as your church home, and then log into your dashboard right on the Church Center app, and that will give you all kinds of access to personalized groups, uh, serving opportunities, and uh, all kinds of things to help you continue to grow and take your next right step. Everything that happens here is the result of your incredible generosity. We're so thankful for you, thankful that you're a part of the Westbridge Church family. Now, tune in and enjoy the rest of the service. If you guys have a space between you, can you scooch in just a little bit? There are a lot of people here, and we really want to make sure that everyone can grab a seat. All right, so if you can stand, we're going to jump into some worship. Slide in if you've got a seat next to you, and we're going to get going. Here we go. Yeah. 
today. We thank you that you are who you say you are. And we are so grateful for that sacrifice. That sacrifice means that absolutely nothing can separate us from you. That sacrifice means that we can live and we can rest with eternal living hope. It's in your name we pray, amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Happy Easter. You guys can go ahead and have a seat and enjoy the rest of the service. Welcome everybody to Westbridge and happy Easter. Whether you are online or in person, thanks so much for being here today. My name is Amanda and I am a part of the communications team. If you're a first time guest with us today, welcome. We are so glad that you're here. On your way in, you may have taken a program. Inside, there are a couple of things. First is a connection card. If you're a first time guest, feel free to fill out as much information as you feel comfortable with. If you bring that card to the Next Steps area in the lobby, we have a t-shirt for you, just as our way of saying thank you for being here today. Also in the program is a giving envelope. If you would like to give today, you can drop it in the giving station on the way out of the auditorium. You can also drop it in the mail anytime, postage paid. You can also give by text. Just text any dollar amount to 84321 to get started. Next week, we are starting a brand new series called Asking for a Friend. And we would love some of your input. If there is something about church or faith or God that you have been curious about, but have just been too nervous to ask, let us know. This is a great series to get your questions answered or to invite a friend to. We've got a poll going on on your dashboard with some options, or you can fill out your own question as well. Just click on My Dashboard in the Church Center app today. My Dashboard is one of the best ways to stay connected here at Westbridge Church, and it will help you take next steps in a very personal way. So, what do you need to do? Just open up the Church Center app. On the homepage, you're gonna click on My Dashboard. Once you've entered your phone number, you'll get a code texted to you, and then you'll be able to log in. Now, this is the only time that you're gonna have to do that. Once you log in, you're good to go, and you will be logged in the next time you open up your app. Now, I will say, if you're new to Westbridge and you've maybe never given us your information before, you will have to go through a little bit more of a process to give us your information so that you can log in. But once you're logged in, you will see a personalized dashboard just for you. You may have a picture at the top. It might be your birthday or your address, but at the top, you're also going to see these little circles that we call badges. Now, some of these badges may be gray and some of them might be teal. Um, and it's not a bad thing if they're gray. It just means that you haven't taken that specific step yet. If you have a gray baptism or giving or serving badge, that's just an encouragement to help you take the next step. When you scroll down, you're gonna see campaigns and messages specifically tailored for you based on your age, your family, and all of those things that we know about you so that you can get exactly what you need to know about what's going on here at Westbridge. So look around and get familiar with it. I encourage you to edit your profile if we have some wrong information for you. It's super helpful for us to be able to have the correct information so that we can give you what you need to know. If you have any questions at all about anything in the app or the dashboard, please feel free to email us at info at westbridgechurch.com because we want this to be a great experience for you so that when you open up our app, you get exactly the information that you need to know. We are so excited to share this with you. And like I said, if you have any questions or concerns, please email us at info at westbridgechurch.com. As we move into the next part of our service, we want you to know that Westbridge is intentional about creating welcoming environments online and in person for everyone. So no matter what your relationship with God is or isn't, we are so glad you're here. Enjoy the rest of the service. Happy Easter! Hey, I just want you to know that has nothing to do with Easter. We just thought this would be fun. So there you go. Uh, my name is Jeremiah. I'm one of the pastors here. It's awesome to have you with us. 
I want to say hello to those of you who are uh, watching online on our online campus. Thanks for joining us there. If you're in one of our parent viewing rooms, that's a great option if you have small children you prefer to keep with you during the service. And I want to say hello to everybody sitting in our overflow, in our lobby, in our cafe. Awesome to have you joining us. Man, what a crazy fun uh, to have so many people here and also beautiful weather. What a great weekend. Uh, This is the weekend, Easter, where we get to celebrate for me, growing up, lots of fun family traditions, and uh, one of those traditions was coloring eggs, and that consisted of us like hard boiling several dozen eggs and then eating egg salad for a month. That was part of the tradition. But uh, we would get this kit, and it consisted of basically five uh, color tablets that you would drop into water. Everything would smell like vinegar for a week, and then you had uh, along with the kit came these little hooks that the egg sat in as you dropped it to its doom, like a little torture hook that you dropped the egg in. And uh, anybody color eggs this year? Lift your hands nice and high. All right, yeah, four of you. All right, that's fantastic. (laughs) What sounds like a great tradition. Uh, And then they started to come out with other things. They came out with like, you put it in the shaker and you shake it up and all the sparkle sticks to it. And then that just created messes and people got sick of that and it didn't work very well. And then they came up with this contraption that you could put the hard-boiled egg in, and it had a pencil, and then you'd spin the egg, and it would give you like a straight line. And you're like, wow, I got a straight line on the egg, and it's now four in the morning, but look at that line, you know? And it all went away, and now you go to the grocery store, you go to Target, Walmart, the drugstore. You know what you find? The original pause this thing is around since I was a kid, and old man Paws is just back going, my grandfather Paws started the Paws empire, and we're doing fine, all right? And you know what you find in it? Five color tablets and a hook. <laughs> Hasn't changed in 50 years, all right? So it's amazing. That's a great tradition. Maybe for some of you, the tradition is, uh, you know, Easter ham, or you have like a, a particular potato casserole that you love, or maybe, I know some of you, uh, like little marshmallow demons, called Peeps. Where are my Peeps fans at? All right. Yeah. Hey, no perfect people allowed, right? So come as you are and uh, it's no problem. But Easter, as much as we love all of the traditions and the, you know, the coloring of eggs and the marshmallow demons and the, uh, you know, somehow eggs that are laid by a bunny. I don't know how that all works, but we hide them. It, it, it's a thing. And uh, as much as we love all that, Really, this is all about a very specific event in human history. And I was thinking about, uh, you know, different events that have come up in your life. And especially at Easter, for some reason, this really reminded me of an event that took place with me and my three youngest kids uh, back in December. We had an opportunity to go to a Vikings game. It was on a Saturday. I was like, oh, this will work perfect for me. And I had a friend who said, man, I've got these four tickets to a Vikings game. I'm not going to use them. They're on a Saturday. Would you guys like to go? And I went, yeah, that'd be awesome. And I didn't even bother to look where the seats were. I just said, dude, yes, send them to me. We'll, I'll take the kids. It'll be fun. And we get to the stadium, and I pull up the email that had the, you know, the ticket transfer in it. And I, I honestly hadn't even looked at it up until this point. And we get into the stadium, and I'm trying to find our seats. And I'm asking an usher, where's this seat? And they bring us all the way to the front row. These were front row seats. I was like, what? This is crazy. And we're right behind the opposing team. And so we're shouting at the the players. I mean, we're super close. And so right when we got down there, we took a picture. This is a picture of me and my three youngest in December. And that's how, these are our seats. I mean, it's unbelievable how close we are to the sideline. It was such a fun game. And, uh, And another one, we took a picture from our seat. Uh, and uh, it kind of looks like my two oldest are holding hands, uh, <laughs> but they're not, <laughs> they're not. It's just, that's her hand. His hand is down there. It's, it's a thing. It's weird. <laughs> they're so hopeful. They're like, come on Vikings. <laughs> and then, uh, we didn't even realize this until after the fact. And we we've been laughing about this all weekend. I'm actually wearing a teeny weeny beanie. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, And we'll get some just for men for my beard at some point. And so we're at the game. And so we're watching the game and, uh, and we're like, this is so exciting, right? And we're, and we're shouting to Colts players. And there's, like, there's one Colts player that's uh, like one of their stars, but he's injured. So he's like, he's wearing shorts and he's going up and down the sideline. He's like cheering on his teammates. And every time the Colts would do something good, uh, he would like, we were yelling back and forth to him and he would point up at me. And I'd be like, come on. And we were like having this like mock, uh, you know, uh, back and forth with each other. And it was so fun, except for the fact that the game started with the Vikings uh, having a punt blocked and then run back for a touchdown. 
So they started out the game horribly, and then they continued the game horribly, because then it followed up with a, an interception that was run back for a touchdown, and then they lost a fumble that was then brought in for another touchdown, and all of a sudden, we're, like, we're sitting there at this game going, this is going to be amazing, and by halftime, I don't know, maybe you remember this, but the score was 33 to 0 at halftime. And so we were sitting there at halftime going, of all the games for us to go to, this is the game we went to. This is my son's face at halftime. Like questioning his own existence, right? He's just like, why? Why am I here? What is what's happening here? And so he's just like, has this intense look of consternation and he's so focused and just like, man, what is happening right now? And so we're all really bummed. And I told, our ki- I told my three kids, I said, listen, we don't go to a lot of Vikings games. I don't care if they lose 80 to zero. We're staying, all right? Because in that picture, you can also see all the empty seats next to him. Because a bunch of people were like, we're out of here. At halftime, there was this migration and people left the stadium, and uh, so we had all these empty seats next to us. There was also a reverse migration where people from uh, other seats started making their way down to us, so we had actually a whole new set of friends in the second half. <laughs> and, and so we're watching the game, and so we're like, all right, we're just going to stick it out. Like, we're going to have fun. We're just going to have a fun experience no matter what. I don't care if they lose 80 to nothing. And so we went and got some food at halftime. We're sitting down. We're watching the second half, and all of a sudden, I like it scored. I was like, all right, that was pretty cool. And finally, like, here we are. We're in the third quarter. They finally put some points on the board. And then they get the ball back. They stop the other Colts. They get the ball back. They score again. And then they score again. And then they score again. And we're like, oh, man, they're going to actually make this loss respectable. You know, like, that's what we were hoping for. Like, at least, at least it's going to be a respectable loss, you know. Uh, and, and then they scored, and they scored, and they scored. And we got all the way down to the last play of the game. And the, for them to win, they have to kick a field goal to win the game. Here's what happened. So we won. Uh, I don't know if you caught that, but the Vikings won. And uh, turns out, I mean, you can hear the fight song. I mean, th- that ball goes through the uprights as time expires and the place erupts. It is so much fun. And you hear the fight song in the background. And everybody is best friends at this point. I mean, it's just like we're all hugging and cheering and it's unbelievable. And we're driving home and we hear that it is the biggest comeback in NFL history. No one has ever been down 33 points and come back to win the game. And so we're, we're sitting there driving home going, you know, at halftime we were like, of all the games for us to go to, I can't believe we went to that game. And we're driving home, we went, of all the games for us to go to, I can't believe we were at that game. It was unbelievable. And it made me think of Easter because Easter is the greatest comeback in history. It is the greatest comeback in all of history. When you think about it, it's absolutely amazing. Easter is the story written by all kinds of eyewitnesses that answers the question that every person should wrestle with at some point in their life. Who is this Jesus? Why do these people celebrate this weekend every year? What is it about Jesus? What is it about this Jesus that they talk about him and they they build their lives around him and and it makes a difference, it seems, even in their life today because it wasn't Jesus' teachings that first convinced the first century followers who he was. It was because they saw him put to death and then they saw him alive again. That is what convinced them. And you may not realize this, but the resurrection of Jesus, his death and resurrection, and the events around that are some of the most detailed and described events in all of ancient literature. We have more written about these few hours of Jesus' life than is written about any other character in that time in human history, and it's not even close. We have so many eyewitness accounts. And when Jesus rose from the dead, so many people saw him So many people that were living in Jerusalem and in Judea, so many people saw him after his resurrection that they did what any of us would do. If you saw someone die and you knew where he was buried and then you saw him a couple of days later, they took to social media. (laughs) 
I mean, first century social media, they started telling their friends about it. They started telling their neighbors about it. They started telling their family about it. They started writing down the details of the events that they had experienced. And there were so many people talking about it. There were so many people writing about their experience that unlike other religions, which most religions sort of evolve over years and decades, this movement of Jesus was launched overnight. This movement of Jesus exploded overnight. Literally within a few weeks, there were thousands and thousands of people who had left whatever religion they claimed to be a part of and began to put their trust in Jesus. This thing exploded, and it was because... Jesus rose from the dead. And just to be clear, nobody was getting wealthy off of the claim that Jesus was resurrected. Nobody was getting uh, propelled into superstardom or receiving fame or being launched into celebrity status. The The Roman government was so upset with these claims that they were actually trying to put a stop to the claims that Jesus had risen from the dead. And yet uh, people kept insisting, even in the face of persecution and even execution, being put to death. They would say, I'm not making this up. I saw him. It really happened. And as much as the Roman government wanted to put an end to what they believed to be this nonsense, they couldn't produce a body. Even though everybody knew where the tomb was, they couldn't produce a body. So several weeks after the resurrection, uh, Peter and James, uh, Peter and John, two of Jesus' closest uh, disciples and friends, they're in the streets of Jerusalem and they're talking about the resurrection. They're telling people this this. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead, that he can bring new life to you. And they're, and they're preaching and they're telling people. And the Hebrew, the, the Jewish leaders are upset about it. And so they actually arrest Peter and John. They bring them in and they start to question them. And here's what Peter and John say. We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. They're like, do what you want. Arrest us, whip us, uh, put us to death, whatever you got to do. You, got, you do what you got to do, but we cannot stop telling about the things that we've seen and heard. And I know, I, I know how that feels. I probably told a hundred people the story of this Vikings game. Like, I can't stop telling people. It's so exciting. And that's just a Vikings game. Whoa. What is so compelling and emotional and charged about this story of Easter? That these guys go, we just can't stop telling people what we've seen and heard. Even when we're arrested and even when we're whipped and even if we are going to be put to death, we're not going to stop telling people what we've seen and what we've heard. And so Easter is the celebration of this very, very specific event in human history, the resurrection of Jesus. And there are far more details to these few hours than there are to anything else in ancient literature. It's not even close. And when you read it, it reads exactly the way that you would expect it to read. It reads exactly the way you would expect. For the last seven weeks here at Westbridge, we've been walking through the last conversation that Jesus had with his disciples. There's five chapters that John writes where he records this dialogue that Jesus has with his disciples on that night that he's eventually arrested. And when Jesus is finished with this dialogue and they move to a garden and Jesus prays with them, and within a couple of hours, the uh, temple guard shows up to arrest Jesus. So Jesus is arrested, and then he is turned over and he's put on trial by the Roman Empire and uh, Pilate, the governor, and then ultimately the next day he is put to death. He is, he is whipped, he is beaten, he is uh, nailed to a cross and put to death. And when you read the story, when you read the, the details and the account of what happened and, and you go through it all you recognize they don't write this as if it's like a myth or a legend. It's not written as a work of fiction. They write it as if it's something that actually happened. If you were going to make up this story to try to get a movement to launch, you would write this so different. You would spin the characters so much differently. If you're trying to get the Jesus movement and keep it alive, you write the leaders of that movement in as incredible heroes. You write them in with bravery. But they didn't do that. In fact, you read how the disciples are scattered. You read in one eyewitness account how one of the disciples is kind of following at a, at a distance and he encounters a Roman guard and the Roman guard grabs him and stops him and says, hey, you're one of those Jesus followers. And he strips out of his clothes and runs away naked, leaving his clothes in the guard's hands. That's how scared he is. You, you have the story of Peter and Peter is following Jesus at a distance, trying to see what's going to happen to him. And he's... At night, he starts to warm himself around a fire, and a middle school girl says, hey, aren't you one of those, you're one of those Jesus disciples. 
And Peter, just out of fear for his own safety, says, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never even met the guy. I've never even heard of him. And you, you look at all these accounts, and they could have put such a good spin on the story. If you were going to write a work of fiction or a myth or a legend or something to say, let's launch this incredible movement, you would write in the main characters as people with tremendous faith and amazing courage and incredible ba- bravery. Instead, what you find is that they're very, very real. And they're real scared, and they're real insecure, and they're really concerned for themselves. They're really concerned for their own safety. And if you're trying to keep the Jesus movement alive, then you talk about how you stood by your man and you rallied around him in his time of need. And, you know, instead the disciples behave like cowards and they're scattered and they don't even show up to his burial. Now, typically, if you were put to death on a Roman cross, you wouldn't receive a burial. Your body would just be thrown into a heap and that's just how they treated people that were put to death in that fashion. Mostly uh, criminals and thieves and, and murderers. And yet here's Jesus. And so two men go and petition Pilate, the Roman governor, and ask for his body. One was a guy named Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee that Jesus had spoken with. Another was a guy named uh, Joseph of Arimathea. And Joseph was a rich individual, and he was kind of following Jesus at a distance, trying to figure out, what do I believe about this man? And him and Nicodemus together go to Pilate, and they ask him for the body of Jesus. Joseph had a a tomb that he was actually saving for himself. This would be where his own body would lay one day. And instead, he decides to honor Jesus and put Jesus in his own tomb that has never been used. So they get Jesus' body and they prepare it for burial and they put it in the tomb and the disciples are nowhere to be seen. They're not around. In fact, Jesus' enemies had more confidence in the Jesus movement continuing than his followers did. When you think about Jesus' enemies, they're more concerned about the Jesus movement continuing than those who had the responsibility to continue it. And the temple leaders actually petition the, the, uh, the Roman governor, Pilate, and they say, we need you to get some Roman guards and to guard the entrance to the tomb because here's what we're afraid of. We're afraid that Jesus' disciples are gonna come and steal his body and then try to tell everybody that he rose from the dead and keep this myth going, this legend going. And we don't want that to happen. And so if you put some guards there, we'll make sure that doesn't happen. And yet when you read the accounts of Jesus' disciples, the eyewitness accounts, here's what you come to discover really quickly. They weren't about to steal the body. That would have been dangerous and pointless, right? That would have put their own lives in danger. And why would you put your own life in danger for a man whose death disproved everything he asked you to believe when he was alive? Like, think about that. On the day Jesus died, everybody unfollowed Jesus. There were zero Jesus followers after that. And it's not because they didn't believe in his teachings, and it's not because he didn't say some really memorable things, and it's not because he never performed any, you know, miraculous signs and wonders. It's because at the very core of Jesus' message was Jesus himself. It was the claims that Jesus made about himself that made his followers want to follow him. In fact, they followed him not really because of his teachings, but in spite of his teachings. A lot of Jesus' teachings were really edgy and borderline offensive. He said some things that they kind of scratched their heads and went, I'm not so sure about that, Jesus. But, you know, I'm going to trust you. There's, There's one point where Jesus says something and like the crowd starts to leave and they go, who can, who can handle that? That's, that feels like, I don't know, that rubs me the wrong way. And Jesus turns to his disciples and says, are you going to leave too? And they go, well. And they say, Jesus, to who else would we turn? You alone have the words of eternal life. Like the stuff you're saying is like, man, it's really out there and it's borderline offensive. And I don't know about all the stuff you're teaching, but I just don't know who else we'd turn to because nobody else has made the claim that you've made. You claim to be... God in the flesh. You you claim to be the Messiah, the, the one we're waiting for. The claim that you made to us is that you're the way and the truth and the life, and nobody goes back to God except through you. And so we're kind of following you, like we're hinging everything on that. And it's not because of your teachings, it's actually kind of in spite of your teachings that we're following you because you're the only one who has made this claim that you're the way back to God. And so we're putting all of our hope in that. And he claimed to be the Son of God. You're not supposed to be able to kill the Son of God. He claimed to be the Messiah. The Messiah isn't supposed to die. Jesus 
says to his disciples, I'm going to start this movement and it's going to continue generation after generation and not even death itself will be able to stop it. And now he's dead. And so if Jesus isn't able to stay alive to keep his own movement alive, why? Why would his followers risk their life to keep a lie alive? Because when Jesus died, hope was lost. When Jesus died, everybody unfollowed Jesus. On Saturday, there were zero Jesus followers. Everybody unfollowed Jesus because after the crucifixion, there was game over. There was nothing to hold on to. There was no movement to keep alive. There was no message worth repeating because Jesus had said too much about himself and now he was dead. And in every single account that you read from the eyewitnesses, themselves, when you read the things that John experienced and Matthew and Peter, and you read the things that they write, their own experiences from their own words, they all admit none of us thought he was coming back. None of us w thought we would see him alive again. No one was expecting him to come back. No one was expecting a comeback. But it turns out to be the greatest comeback in history. John walks through this morning where they discover that Jesus is alive. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, which is actually a reference to John. And I just want to note, John's the one writing this. <laughs> I don't know if that's just like a nickname he gave himself. I don't know if he's got some like self-esteem issues. I don't know what's going on, but she finds Peter and John or the one Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Now, here's what's amazing about this. Mary was a woman who was a follower of Jesus. Jesus had healed her. She was following him. She had hoped that he would be everything he claimed to be. And now she's in incredible pain. You, you can imagine she's realized it's over and she's going to the tomb and, and she's going to anoint his body with uh, you know, essential oils, basically, and uh, it was a way for them to show honor to someone who had died, and because Jesus had died late in the day on Friday, and Saturday was their Sabbath, where they weren't allowed to do any work, she had to wait till Sunday. And we don't even know, like, what she's thinking. I don't know what her frame of mind is. I don't know if she's just in so much grief. She hasn't thought about the fact that he's in a tomb with a stone rolled in front of it, and there's probably Roman guards. She just goes, I just have to do something. I'm going to go there. I'm going to see what I can do to honor my Lord. And when she gets to the empty tomb, her response is not, boom, resurrection. <laughs> that wasn't what she's thinking. Even though, this is amazing, Jesus had made the claim about himself that he would rise from the dead. And she gets to the tomb and it's empty and her first thought isn't, oh yeah, that's right, he said that. Her first thought is, I better go find John and Peter and the disciples and tell them that somebody has moved his body. They must not want us to even be able to honor him as our Lord because why would they move the body? And so uh, Peter and John run back to the tomb. And again, if you read the account, you know, about four times John mentions that he run, ran faster and he got there first and Peter followed him. And then again, I don't, John's got some self-esteem stuff that I'm sure he's worked through, but uh, they get to the tomb and they look in and they're perplexed and neither if you read the account, it's not John or Peter. Neither of them goes, oh, he said he was going to do this. They're perplexed, they're bewildered, and they just walk away, leaving Mary at the tomb. This is where we pick it up in the next verse. Mary is standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. You can imagine the pain and the grief. And now not only is it, like it's adding insult to injury, that not only is... Uh, her rabbi and her teacher and her Lord and everything she's put her hope in is gone. But now she f they've stolen the body. We can't even pay our respects. And as she's stooping in, uh, looking in, she saw two white robe angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they've taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. Now think about this. Mary is talking to angels. She's having a conversation with angels, and still the idea of resurrection does not even occur to her. It doesn't even cross her mind. 
This, is, this tells you the state of mind that Mary is in. Imagine the, the emotion of this. This man healed me. This man changed my life. And now he's dead. God didn't come through. And, and how, how can I put my trust in anything ever again? And she wept and she bent over the tomb, completely heartbroken, thinking that Jesus is not only dead, but now there's grave robbers. And she turned around to leave and she saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Again, think about this. Jesus said, I'm going to rise from the dead. Death's not going to stop this movement. He dies. They go, well, it's over. They get to the tomb. She, she talks to angels. And she goes, yeah, they've stolen his body. Now she's looking at Jesus directly and doesn't recognize him. This tells you the state of mind that she's in, in her grief. She was not expecting. And do you know why she went there? She was, she was expecting to find a body. She wasn't expecting to find Jesus alive. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? And you can imagine like the emotion Jesus is experiencing. He's, he has to be grinning from ear to ear, just going, oh man, she doesn't recognize me. And he knows in just a moment, he's about to reveal himself. And I, I love this. When you read this, this is just so raw. She thought he was the gardener. This tells you where she's at. Sir, she said, if you've taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Again, think about this frame of mind. Did, did you move the body? I'll go get I'll, I'll, Tell me where you put the body of a grown man, and I'll go and fetch it. I'll get a wheelbarrow. I'll hoist him on my shoulder. We don't know what she's thinking, right? But she just goes, I'll go get him. Just tell me where you've put him. I just, I, I'm, in, I'm so grief-stricken. I need to know. Mary. Jesus said. And as soon as Jesus calls her by name, she becomes aware. Her eyes are open. She, she begins to see. She turned to him and cried out, teacher. She sees him. She recognizes him. As soon as Jesus says her name, she starts to recognize he has actually come back to life. And so Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. It's so raw. It's so real. If you were making up a story to get people to try to believe your myth and your legend and your work of fiction, you would never have a woman in the first century be your primary witness. Because in the first century, especially in the Roman Empire, women had no legal standing. They had no credibility. They were essentially property. And so to have a woman be your primary witness to lend credibility to this story would make no sense at all. But do you know why it's written that way? Because that is exactly how it happened. And there are so many eyewitnesses who wrote about it, and I love it. It, That's absolutely raw. We saw him die. Is this even possible? She quickly ran to tell the others. (laughs) There are so many parts of this story that if you're going to make it all up, you would have written it so different. But what we have is a bunch of eyewitnesses who said, I saw Jesus. I saw him die. I saw where they laid him in the tomb. And I went there. And then I saw him, and he appeared to hundreds of people after he rose from the dead. It's the greatest comeback in history. And the resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of our comeback story. It's the beginning of your comeback story. It's the beginning of my comeback story, because every one of us are born into this world where we are entrapped and enslaved and imprisoned by our own sin. And it separates us from God. It separates us from each other. And the only way back is through Jesus. So the resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of our comeback. If Jesus rose from the dead, as all of the eyewitnesses claimed, then that means he is who he says he is, and we can put our trust in him. Because if death is reversible, then that means anything is possible, which means there is nothing that you could do that would take you so far away from God, from his love and from his mercy and from his grace, that there is not a comeback for you and a comeback for me. Since Jesus has the power over death, that means he has the power to set us free from the things that are bringing death to us. Our sin, our guilt, the anxiety about where I stand with God, the the kingdoms and systems of this world, Jesus wants to bring resurrection to us, and it's something that we can experience moment by moment, day by day. Because the resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of our comeback story. A little over 20 years later, a guy named Paul would eventually become a follower of Jesus. 
And he would travel around the Roman Empire and he would start a church and then he'd hand it over to a pastor and he'd move on and start another church, hand it off to a pastor and move on. He did this again and again and again. There's churches all over the Roman Empire that are starting up and the, the movement of Jesus is growing and spreading like crazy across the Roman Empire. Within 20 years of Jesus' death and resurrection, hundreds of thousands of people are following Jesus. It's, be, it's becoming the, the main belief system in the Roman Empire. It's just spreading like wildfire. And so the, the, Romans, uh, the Roman Empire actually arrests Paul and even eventually executes Paul. And yet, even from prison, he continues to write letters back to these churches that he has started and he instructs them, this is what it looks like this is, this is how you can live out your own comeback story. This is what the love of Jesus has done for me. This is what it's done for you. This is how you live out the way of Jesus. This is how you continue to love in this world, even in the face of intense persecution, even in the face of arrest, even in the face of execution, because we believe in one who has overcome death. And so he's writing letters back. And in one letter, he writes to a group of churches in the region of Galatia, and he writes this, my old self has been crucified with Christ. In other words, he says, you, you know the story that Jesus was crucified, that he was nailed to a cross. And I just want you to know that the, the, the part of me, the old me, the part of me that is enslaved to sin, it was crucified as well. In fact, at one point he would write this, all the stuff I know I should do, I don't do it. All the stuff I know I shouldn't do, I do that. What is the matter with me? And if you've ever thought like, dude, that's in the Bible, that's my life. This is exact, that's why it's so relatable. Paul never says, hey, all the stuff I know I should do, I do it all the time. I'm really good at it. He goes, no, I, I, what is wrong with me? I'm enslaved to sin. And then he writes and says, but that part of me, my old self, the old me that's enslaved to sin, that's entrapped by sin, that part of me has been crucified with Christ. In the same way that Jesus was put to death, that old me has been put to death. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And he says, I, now I still have this body to deal with. I still live in this earthly body, but I do it by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He says, because Jesus died and rose again, the old me is put to death and I can rise again. He writes this in a letter to people in the Roman Empire. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, in the same way that God's Spirit came into Jesus and brought him back to life, he says, now we also may live new lives. The old me, he says, is put to death. The me that's enslaved and entrapped and imprisoned by sin, it's gone, it's been crucified, it's been put to death, and now I live by the power of God's Spirit. I can live new lives, and you can live new lives. And so the resurrection of Jesus is the greatest comeback in history, and it gives us assurance that there is nothing in this life that can take us so far out of God's reach that there isn't a comeback story for you. And so what are you facing right now that you feel has you disqualified? What are you facing right now that you would say, you know what, Here, here's what I got. This sin, this lifestyle, this belief system, uh, you know, this this desperation, this depression, this despair, this discouragement. Here's what I'm facing. I've got all kinds of skepticism about God or faith or religion or church. I've got all kinds of, uh, you know, cynicism towards that. I've got a lot of questions. I've got a lot of doubts. I've got a lot of baggage. I've got this huge past. So what? The resurrection of Jesus is the greatest comeback in history. Nobody thought this would move forward. And it did in spite of overwhelming odds. And it continues to move forward, and you're invited. And you are never disqualified. And as you read these accounts, here's what you discover. If anybody thought that they were disqualified, it was a guy hanging on the cross next to Jesus. And admittedly, by his own admission, he says, I deserve to be here. This is the just consequence for my own actions. But Jesus, is there any way, is there any chance that there's a comeback story for me? Is there any chance that you could forgive me? Is there any chance that you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus, I have to imagine with, with love and grace in his eyes, says, you're in. That's who we're dealing with. And your comeback isn't based on what you can do, it's based on what Jesus has already done. He simply asks that you don't try to do it on your own. 
but that you put your trust in him. And you allow his Holy Spirit to help you as you move forward. And that's why we say all the time, hey, you know what? Come as you are. That's not just a cute church slogan. We genuinely believe that that's how God accepts you, as is. All of your baggage, all of your sin, all of your past, all of your questions, all of your doubts, whatever you've got, you bring it with you. And then God says, look at you, you're a mess. I love you. Look at you, however messy you are, I accept you as is. But God loves you too much to just leave you as is. He says, hey, why don't you link up with a bunch of other messy, broken people? And together, we move forward. We help each other, and we encourage each other, and we lift each other up. And then God's Spirit does what only God's Spirit can do and brings new life and brings resurrection to us, moment by moment, day by day. And then Jesus made one last promise, that he would come back again. And that when he comes back again, all things will be as they should be. And that includes you, and that includes me. We were created by God to exist in loving, loving relationship, loving community with God and with one another. And yet, every single one of us, from the first human beings to every one of us today, at some point said, I'm going to live life my own way. And every one of us have made decisions that have caused brokenness between myself and God and myself and other people. And that's why God sent Jesus into the world to initiate the greatest comeback in history. And Jesus came into this world and he said, look, I'm going to allow myself to be put to death, go through this painful death, be nailed to a cross. But along with that, all of your sin is getting nailed to that cross as well. I'm taking it with me. And now, because Jesus, his body was laid in a tomb, and according to multiple eyewitness accounts, he rose from the dead. And that means death is not the end. There is more to this life than this life, and it is the beginning of your comeback story. And if you've never said yes, you're invited. You don't behave your way in. You don't earn your way in. You don't church attend your way in. You're just invited because of who God is. He created you and he loves you. So come back to the God who created you. Come back to the God who loves you. And if you've never said yes to that, or if you said yes at one point and you're like, man, it's been a long time and I want to I wanna come back to that, then I just would invite you, whether you're online, whether you're in a, the lobby, the cafe, parent viewing room, wherever you're at, in the room, just say yes to this prayer. God, please forgive my sins. Forgive me for the decisions that I've made, the times that I've walked away from you, and I'm so grateful that you never walk away from me. And I want to say yes to your invitation. Make me your son. Make me your daughter. And then help me to put my trust in you, to follow you and your way of living as best as I know how from this moment on. God, I, I want to experience resurrection in my own life on a regular basis. And so go with me and help me in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, one of the ways that we celebrate that, uh, all the time, we celebrate it all the time, but particularly on these days when we love to uh, remember the sacrifice of Jesus is through communion. So you should have received uh, our little astronaut communion on your way in today. If you did not receive one of these and you want to participate with us, just lift your hand and we've got some ushers that'll make sure and get one of these into your hand this morning and they'll make sure and get that to you. And uh, in the meantime, uh, if I want you to know we practice open communion here so you don't have to be a member at Westbridge in order to celebrate this with us. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you should know that uh, this is rich symbolism for those who are followers of Jesus. So if you're just exploring faith or trying to figure that out, you may be more comfortable observing. But we practice open communion, and uh, there's no prerequisite to celebrating this with us together. Now, uh, here's what this means for us. This is not meant to be an a elaborate ceremony. This is a very, very simple thing that means every time we're around the table and we break bread, w whether we're in a group like this or with our family or friends, that should be a moment that we pause and, ex and express our gratitude for the sacrificial love of Jesus. And so Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed and on the night that he was arrested, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this represents my body, which will be broken for you, speaking about his own death. And he said, every time that you break bread together, I want you to remember that sacrifice. And so today, as we remember the sacrificial love of Jesus through his broken body, let's receive the bread. In the same way, he took the cup and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this represents my blood, which will be spilled for you. And he said, this is a new covenant between God and humanity. 
the old way of shedding the blood of an animal to atone for your sins, as that was a symbolic way for you to understand. But from now on, my death and resurrection is the thing that will break the power of sin in your life. And so Jesus says, this, every time that you receive the cup together, I want you to remember the sacrificial love. And so as we remember the sacrificial love of Jesus through his spilled blood, let's receive the cup together. Let's pray. God, thank you for sending Jesus into this world. And thank you that we don't have to rely on our own ability, but we can put our trust in the work that has already been done. It's already been done on our behalf. And now we can just put our trust in what Jesus has done for us. And thank you, not only for this sacrifice, the love of Jesus, but also for the, the power and the authority to overcome death. And we pray that as followers of you, we would continue to experience resurrection in our own lives, dead to sin, our old selves dead and buried and resurrected and living new lives each and every moment of each and every day. And as we do, may our lives be a reflection of your love and your grace to the world around us. We thank you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeremiah. So here is how we are going to close today. In just a moment, as a part of our worship, we're going to have the opportunity to give back a portion of what God has entrusted to us financially. As many of you guys prepare to do that, would you grab out your connection card, either the one in your program, or you can find the connection card on the Church Center app. If you prayed that prayer with Jeremiah a few moments ago and accepted Jesus for the first time, would you check that box and let us know? We would just love to celebrate that with you this week. If you have any prayer requests, you can also write those on the back of your connection card. And I want you to know that as a staff, we pray over those prayer requests each and every week. If you are going to be giving today, there's some other ways to give up on the screen. And we never want to miss an opportunity to say thank you for being such a generous church. Everything we do is because of people like you who give so generously. Um, we also, we love to help you take next steps in your faith. Um, if you log on to the Church Center app, there's something that we have called My Dashboard. Um, and My Dashboard is personalized to you and the things that you have done in taking steps in faith. And it will help you take the next best step for you. Um, we are starting a new series this week, or next week, um, and it's called Asking for a Friend. Now, asking for a friend is all about those questions that you're maybe too nervous to ask about. Things about church, about faith, about God, anything that you've been, you know, questioning, but you're just not sure if that's an okay question to ask, we want you to ask it. So if you log on to my dashboard, we have a poll going on, and you can add your own option or choose one of the options that are on there about something that maybe you're not quite sure about. And we would love to help have you guys help us shape that series. And it's also a really great series for you to invite a friend to come back to. Um, if you are picking up kids today, make sure you have your parent pickup tag for our safety team. Um, anything you aren't taking with you, you can put in the giving stations on the way out of the auditorium. Thanks again for being here on Easter Sunday, and happy Easter, and enjoy the rest of your weekend.